This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to church. I pray that you will be blessed by being here. I pray that God will speak his word through what you hear here today and through what you experience. Thank you for coming to church. Let's open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come into your house, we worship you. We praise your name, and we thank you for the gifts that you've given to us. I pray that you will be with us, touch our hearts, and guide us in your truth. In your holy name we pray this, Lord Jesus. Amen. As we get started here today, I'd actually like to start by uh, reading the psalm. If I could ask Wayne to come up and read the psalm for us. Psalms 104, verses 27 to 34. They all wait for thee to give them their food in due season. Thou dost give to them, they gather it up. Thou dost open thy hand, they are satisfied with good. Thou dost hide thy face, they are dismayed. Thou dost take away their spirit, they expire and return to their dust. Thou dost send forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou dost re renew the face of the ground. Let the glory of the Lord endure forever. Let the Lord be glad in his workers, works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. I, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have, have my being. Let my meditation be pleasing to him. As for me, I shall be glad in the Lord. Well, good morning. What an honor it is to be with you today. I want to read to you out of Psalm 34. It tells us to magnify the Lord and to exalt his name forever. And so I want to do that today. I want to magnify and exalt the great name of Jesus with you today. Let's worship. Strong 
in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord. He's the Lord of all. When He shall come with trumpet sound, oh man. Just in his righteousness alone And faultless stand before the throne Oh, what a day that'll be When we are face to face with our King Jesus When all will be made right But until that day We put all of our hope in who Jesus is the one who walks with us in the storm, the one who is the Lord of it all, the one who reigns over everything. Come on, let's declare that he is Christ alone, our cornerstone today. Christ alone, cornerstone, a weak man strong in the Savior's love and through the Lord of all. Yes, he is. Sing Christ alone, in Christ alone. Cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. And through the storm, he is Lord. He's the Lord of we say whatever it is that we're facing, whatever the circumstance, whatever the season may be, we stand firm on the truth of who God is and declare that He is the Lord of all. He is our hope. He is our hope in it all. He is our living hope. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope sing who could imagine who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me Christ, 
sing this good news together again then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to So we lift up our praise to him. We sing a hallelujah to the one who set us free. Come on, let's sing that again. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. This salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Amen. We thank you, Father. We thank you for being here right now in this very moment, moving in our midst, working in our hearts and working in our lives. We give you all the glory and all the honor forever and ever, and we worship you. Thank you, Lord. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. Sing, you are here. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, oh, I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. Oh, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. Oh, I worship you. Cause you are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are 
Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. Oh, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. Oh, I worship you. Oh, you are here, yes. You're turning lives around. I worship you. Oh, I worship you. You are here. You are here. You mend every heart. I worship you. Oh, I worship you. I'll sing this together. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, we know that he is working. Amen. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, oh, even when, oh. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop, you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, yes, it is. You are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 that is Yes, Lord, that is who you are. You are a miracle worker. You are a promise keeper. You are a way maker when there seems to be no way. And today we put all of our hope in who you are, Lord. As a Lord of everything, the entire universe, every situation, every circumstance, you see it and you know it. 
And your word says that there's not a prayer that goes unheard by you. And so God, we take comfort in that, comfort in what your word says. We put all of our hope and trust in who you are, Lord, as our way maker today. And we worship you. And for as long as our breath, our lungs have breath, we will worship and praise your name. For there is no name like yours, no name that is worthy of such praise. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Quail from the Lord. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also, the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. Moses heard the people of every family wailing, each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord became exceedingly angry and Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your, on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms? As a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their forefathers. Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too much. If this is how you're going to treat me, put me to death right now. If I have found favor in your eyes and do not let me face my own ruin. The Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. So Moses went out and told the people what Mo the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them, had them stand around the tent. And then the Lord came down and in the cloud and spoke with him and he took of the spirit that was on him and put the spirit on 70 elders. And when the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. However, two men, whose names were Eldad and Medad, had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, who had been, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Okay, now from the book of Mark. Getting closer, getting closer. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against you is not against us, is for us. I tell you the truth. Anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. And if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where worms do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. Thus the word. Thank you very much, Rudy. I'd also like to read from James. 
James chapter 5, starting at verse 13. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crop. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. When Christians pray, God listens. Prayer moves the hand that moves the universe. There was a small church in the southern states where people had been in a state of terrible drought. The crops were failing and there was little water even for the animals. Even the church lawn was looking pretty shabby. So the preacher called for a prayer meeting that the people might pray for rain. When the day of the prayer meeting came about, everyone in the whole community came. The church was packed, and the preacher got up to speak. How many of you came here to pray for rain today, he asked. And there were hands raised and nods all over the sanctuary. And again, his eye searched over the congregation, and he asked them again, Then how come none of you brought an umbrella? We hold weekly prayer meetings at the church on Monday nights, and many of us come together for the, to speak of the needs that we feel and to pray together. And when we do, we know that God moves through us. But there are still many that feel that prayer is not a potent force. And this is the case in many people's lives and in many churches. And we all do feel inadequate at times. So we need to ask along with the disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. James, the writer of the book that we've just been reading, was the son of Mary and Joseph, and he was known as being a fervent prayer. Eusebius of Caesarea wrote a few years later that James' nickname was Old Camel's Knees. James spent so much time in prayer that his knees developed calluses. And when we read his letter, it's evident that prayer was a very important part of his life. In the first chapter, James says, if any of you lack wisdom, ask God. In the fourth chapter, he says, you don't have because you don't ask. And in the fifth chapter, he mentions prayer seven times. He writes about prayer that is effective and powerful. The Greek word for effective actually has the same root as the word energy. I have never known an effective pastor who does not have an effective prayer life. In fact, I've never known an effective Christian who doesn't have an effective prayer life. Prayer can take the average Christian life and turn it into an effective, powerful force once it's put into practice. It can also change churches. Times of revival are wonderful and amazing. And they begin first in the prayer room before they ever make their way to the sanctuary. I remember times when I was younger where the whole congregation, it seemed, would come together in a time of prayer. There were big prayer meetings. And prayer is a wonderful thing because the God we pray to is a living, powerful God who hears and answers our prayers. So let me first ask you, when, when should we pray? 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Rejoice always, 
Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And I actually like the way the English Standard Version puts it, which is, pray without ceasing. Personally, I made a choice a few years back that if anyone brought a prayer request to me, I would pray for it immediately. I found that if I didn't pray for it immediately, I would forget about it. I might pray for it later on in the day if I remembered. Or I might pray for it but not have quite the same fervency in my prayer. So I decided that I would pray immediately when someone brought a prayer request to me. I assume that if God puts a need on my heart, that he means for me to pray for it immediately. And we should come to the Lord with everything. When we come into the school, for those of us who are students, and the teacher gives a prop, pop quiz, you can pray, Lord, keep my memory clear. And for those of you who uh, came unprepared, you might pray, Lord, come quickly. When we have trouble with a coworker, we may pray, Lord, give us a spirit of peace and love. And if we have sickness, we pray, Lord, heal me so that I may again do your good work. 2 Thessalonians says, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored, just as it was with you, and pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith. Another form of prayer that James points out in verse 13 is singing. And maybe you've never considered singing as a form of prayer, but it certainly is. The book of Psalms is a collection of 150 prayers that are meant to be sung. The Fair family and others who lead in worship are prayer and worship leaders. They guide us in our singing prayer. And the songs we sing on Monday morning aren't just there to fill up the time. They are expressions from the heart. It says if you're happy, sing songs of praise. But it also says, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So even if you're feeling down, the act of singing, a prayer of song, can actually lift a spirit of heaviness. Remember Paul and Silas when they were in prison? What did they do? They prayed, and I'm sure they prayed out loud. They sang songs of praise. And I can just imagine the other prisoners being in there, who are probably used to hearing a lot of cursing, uh, a lot of people denouncing their uh, you know, wailing, having been there. I'm sure it must have made quite an impression on them to hear Paul and Silas singing songs of praise. And Acts tells us that suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. Now that is a prayer of power. James says, is one of you in trouble? Let him pray. And if anyone is happy, let him sing songs of praise. And he says, is any one of you sick? Let him call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. The word sick here means extreme illness, incapacitated, someone who is without strength to take care of themselves. And they would call the elders to come and pray for them. So, why call the elders? Because the elders are there to represent the entire church. Any one of the church can go and pray. The elders are known to be righteous, upstanding people, and that's why they were mentioned here. But it's the righteous men whose prayers are powerful. James 5.16 says, The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. See, divine healing is not imaginary. It is not simply an exercise of willpower. It is not a mind cure. It is not spiritualism. It is not immunity from death or from sickness. For even those who are healed, when their work is done, they die. Divine healing is the direct power of God upon the body. As many of you know, I have a little collection of older books at home. I love collecting old books. Many of them are religious in nature. And I'm 
I have one here called Remarkable Incidents and Modern Miracles Through Prayer and Faith by G.C. Bevington. I know the title of the book is very dry. But I'll tell you what, the stories in here are absolutely amazing. Bevington was born before the year 1900. He was infirm. He had a poor education. He was the son of a backslidden preacher. But he did have a godly mother. And her prayers were effectual for his salvation. Bevington became a man of great faith and prevailing prayer. He would often spend days in prayer, often out in the woods, and he saw some amazing, extraordinary things accomplished through the power of God in his lifetime. I'm going to read a little excerpt from his book here. He says, It is not our business to save people, but it is our business to lead them to Christ. And so it is not our business to heal people, but it may be and should be our business to lead them to Jesus, who has promised to heal them. Divine healing is not the most important teaching in the Bible, but it is a truth. And God has shown me, and we cannot avoid it without detriment to our spiritual development. Divine healing is not doctrine or theory, but a living fact, thoroughly established in the Word of God. Divine healing is, in its deepest sense, its truest sense, a life of utter abandonment to God, an incessant dependence upon him, a dependence on the power beyond ourselves in the most trying places. And he goes on to say, I will now give you some evidences and facts. While holding a meeting near Hopewell, Kentucky, I was called to Brother Jim Felties to pray for his wife's healing. She lay as a dead person, had been in bed, I think, two or three weeks, not expected to live. We asked Jim if we could go down, if he would go down with us for victory for her healing, all in the name of our blessed, compassionate Christ. He said that he could, so we got down and prayed. We were there some three hours when her brother, Les Bradford, came in, so he got down with us. We lay perhaps two hours longer waiting on God. Finally, we were led to go out. I said, "'Tis done." Brother Les said, "'I know it.'" And he got up, and we went outdoors. In less than five minutes, Mrs. Felty was out of that bed, reeling like a drunken woman. We all felt the power of God. She assisted in getting supper, and went to prayer meeting that night, setting the congregation on fire by her testimony. Sometimes it takes much waiting on God, other times not so much. After reading a good portion of this book, I think that five hours he spent in prayer was uh, what he would consider not so much. <laughs> There's a lot of other good stories in this book, and if you have the inkling, I do recommend you read it. In James 5.14, we see that oil is a symbol of the blessing of God. Now, I just want to make a point. This isn't magical oil. The oil itself does not heal like some conjurer's trick. The Lord who he hears the prayer is the one who does the healing. In verse 15, it says, And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. The oil is a symbol of his blessing. And there is some power in symbols. We use other symbols in the church. And remember... Following the guidance of the Bible is never in error. When our own thoughts and those of the Bible disagree, we need to understand in humility that the Bible is the first place of reference. In the Lord's Supper, the bread and the fruit of the vine are symbolic of Christ's body and blood. In baptism, burial in water is a symbol of dying and being resurrected in Christ. And although these are symbols, they're not merely symbols that we can dispense with. There is something deeper in these acts than the symbols themselves. So there is nothing wrong with the practice of anointing with oil as a symbol of the power of prayer. And perhaps there is, this is something that should be performed more often in the church. But what makes a prayer effective? The main basic requirement is faith. James 5.15, a prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. A tentative, skeptical prayer 
doesn't have much power. The prayer of the elders must be offered in faith. Not like the double-manded mind in, in, uh, of the man in James chapter 1, which reads, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. We should pray with confidence. Hebrews 11.6 tells us, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Another prerequisite the powerful prayer is righteousness before God. And I dare say, it is difficult to come before God in faith without righteousness. Faith comes in a light, from a life of obedience and honoring God. Verse 16 tells us, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Right relationships with people are so important. The Bible makes it clear that we cannot have a right, right relationship with God without having a right relationship with other people. There is a vertical relationship that has to be right by faith and a horizontal relationship that has to be right by confession. So that our prayers can have power, we must remember that when we're at odds with another Christian, we are at odds with God and we're not ready to pray. An example of this comes from 1 Peter, where he says, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives, and treat them with respect, as the weaker partner, and as heirs with you in the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. And James says, Confess your sins to each other, and pray for each other, so that you may be healed. And a quick word of caution. Confessing your sins to each other does not mean spilling your life to anybody who will listen. Some people brag about how hard their life is. That's a form of pride. We confess our sins to the person against whom we've sinned and for whom we need forgiveness. And if a person does that, you have the responsibility to forgive that person for whom Christ died. You forgive as God has forgiven you, and as you expect him to forgive you. Someone once told John Wesley, the, the famous pr preacher, he said, uh, I never forgive. And Wesley replied, well, then I hope you never sin. The closer we walk with God, the more powerful our prayers are going to be. Psalm 84.11 says, The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. If you want your, walk, or your prayer to be powerful, then walk in obedience to God. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful. James also does something wonderful for us and gives us an example of prayer. Let's read verses 17 and 18 again. It says, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would rain, or that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Now we might think that Elijah was something very special and far beyond us to be able to pray these kinds of prayers. But what James says is that, a man, that Elijah was a man just like us. He wasn't perfect. He knew what it was like to be depressed. Elijah, we even read, gave in to self-pity. He needed support just like any of us do. But he was God's prophet at a time when Israel was reeking with sin. Elijah was sent by God to urge the nation to repent. They didn't repent, so he prayed that they would be disciplined by a drought. And James says that it didn't rain for three and a half years. Finally, Elijah prayed for rain, and guess what? It rained. Now, how can you and I pray with that kind of power? It starts with being sincere. Look at verse 17 again. 
Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain in the land for three and a half years. Elijah prayed earnestly. He didn't just mouth words or say religious things. Too often people, when they pray, they, it's just religious phrases or sayings, or they repeat themselves endlessly. God is not impressed with those kind of rituals or prayers that don't come from the heart. I'm reminded of a uh, visitor who went to a farmhouse to visit a family, husband and wife and kids, and uh, he was asked to pray grace before the meal. He was a little bit nervous probably, and he, uh, he bellowed out a long, loud prayer to God, and uh, afterwards, a little girl leaned into her mother and said, Mom, if he was closer to God, he wouldn't have to speak so loud. God isn't concerned with wordy prayers. He's concerned with intense and sincere prayers. So the question is, how can you become a prayer warrior? First, pray daily. Schedule a definite time in your life when you're going to pray. Make it a habit. Now, we ought to pray also as the day goes on, but we need to make a commitment of time to God where we have that appointed time one-on-one. -on -one. And when we have that scheduled time, it becomes a regular part of our day. And I've personally found that it works best for me to do it at the first part of my day. And that's the time I actually enjoy praying the most, when my heart is quiet. It is incredibly important to schedule that quiet time with God. We need to tithe and give him the first fruits of our time, just as we do the, the first fruits of any of our other resources. Second, we need to find a place where we can be alone. Jesus said, but when you go to pray, go to your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. We need to pray together in church, but we also need that private time of prayer. And we should pray in everyday language. It does not have to be flowery. Talk to God in normal language. We don't have to use these and thous or fancy prayers that we may have heard other people use. Just tell him what's on your heart. Speak the words as they come and speak them out of your mouth, out loud, because there is power in the spoken word. And fourthly, I'd recommend find a prayer partner. I've found that my prayer life is very effective when I have someone that I can pray with. Someone who is near to me both in spiritual beliefs and someone I can consider an equal in many areas. Men, I do encourage you to pray with your wives. And wives, I encourage you to pray with your husbands. Those of you who are dating or coming close to that age, <clears throat> I recommend you date someone with whom you can pray and be at peace bringing your prayers to God together. It, there is a lot of truth when it says the family that prays together stays together. And of course, come and join on Monday nights for prayer. We come together as a congregation to pray because we know that, that it's powerful and we know that God moves through our prayers. Where two or more are joined together, God is there in the midst. Let's pray together now. Gracious Father, thank you for the words that you've given to me to speak. And I pray that they'll grow. Lord, I pray that, uh, that those who are un unsaved that have heard this, that your word will be made known to their hearts and that you'll open up an understanding. And Lord, I pray that those of us who are saved would shine the light of Christ as we love others. Lord, I pray that those who are sick hearing this will be made well. Not by the power of my words, Lord, but by the power of the prayer and the power that you have and the glory of your name. Lord, I pray that you'll bless this congregation, 
guide them in prayer, guide them in coming closer to you in every way, in every day. And I ask this in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Go and pray. Pray often. Pray without ceasing. Don't give up an opportunity to pray for someone else. And I'll leave you with this. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that, it is, that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.